Well, you may have heard before that we live in a pluralistic society, which is just a really fancy word uh, to mean that there are many religions and beliefs which vie for the allegiance of our hearts and our minds and our lives. However, if you were to live in the first century in ancient Greece or Rome or in Jerusalem, the fact is that that was also a very pluralistic society as well. The world has always had a lot of other gods, a lot of other altars to which a person could bend their knee. In our adult Sunday school class, if you've joined us for some of the videos, uh, some of the things that they've pointed out is uh, the ways in which uh, the Egyptian gods were so prominent in Israel and how uh, when God brought them out of Israel, Part of the story is that God was showing them that he was the one true God over all the other gods that were worshipped in ancient Egypt. And in our reading today, and if you were to continue to read in the book of Acts or other places in the New Testament, you would hear uh, that the world into which Jesus stepped and the world of the earliest followers of Jesus was also a world that had many, many gods that people worshipped. And at that time, the head of the household would decide who would be worshipped. And there were a lot of options out there. Now, the story that we read in Acts 14 takes place in the community of Lystra. And and there was a story that was told in that area of two gods who went walking in disguise. And they received a cool reception from the people because nobody recognized them. And so in their anger, these gods destroyed that town. However, there was an old and pious couple in the area who took in these two strangers, and it turned out that they were the gods Hermes and Zeus, and they were rewarded for their hospitality. Into this pluralistic world, God sent the messengers, Paul and Barnabas. Now, we shouldn't miss the humor in the story that we read in the book of Acts. Uh, We can't take our scriptures so seriously that we miss the fun that is actually in this story with the apostles not understanding what's going on and the people talking in their own language and a whole bunch of confusion. But we also want to look at this story and see how uh, this story will help us today with the message of the living God to our society. Because then, as now, God sends us into this world that he loves so much despite the many options that are out there for worship, to be his messengers to this world. We're going to get to the incident in Lystra in just a moment, but if we'll back up just uh, uh, to Acts 13, where we began our reading. And I want to just explore for a moment how it is that Paul and Barnabas end up where they do. These three verses at the beginning of Acts 13 are more than just an introduction to the story in chapter 14. They demonstrate some very important things about the nature of ministering in our world. Now, first of all, we have a group of believers at this church in Antioch, and they're called prophets and teachers. And we're given a list of names, and it's very easy to look at lists of names and to just kind of glaze over them as people that we don't know, people we never hear from again, some of them, so maybe who really cares about who these people are or were. But this is our list. Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Saul and Barnabas are the only ones that reappear in our story, and the others are named but not remarked upon. But the truth is that these names represent real people, people who were in service to God. And if we look a little bit closer, These are quite the group of people that are named. So we have Saul, who becomes Paul, and Barnabas. And at this point in our story, uh, we'd we'd read in Acts, if you were to start at the beginning, you start, and he focuses quite a lot on Peter and the other disciples. But at this point in Acts, it begins to shift away from Peter and on to Paul and his journeys as he brings the witness of Jesus to the end of the earth. But he's commissioned by this group of believers in Antioch with some significant names here that we should examine. One writer says this, In these verses we meet as ragtag a group of disciples on the way as ever there was. First, 
In the Antioch church, we have a, a Jew from Cyprus whose practice is certainly questionable since he is not likely to have been able to make the trip to the temple. We also have Simeon called Niger, who is probably a black man, but we're unsure uh, whether or not his nickname indicates his color or his race, but he probably comes from North Africa. We also have a servant or a friend, depending on your translation, of Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas is the man who ordered the death of John the Baptist. So we have somebody that was, or at least used to be, very close to the people in power. And in addition, we have uh, Paul, or Saul, who was once a Pharisee, who held the jackets so that others could have full use of their arms in stoning the first martyr, Stephen. So this group of prophets and teachers at Antioch are as diverse and as strange a group as you can imagine. And these names aren't even given much comment. They're just included as this group of people that met together and were empowered by the Holy Spirit to send Paul or Saul and Barnabas out into the world. One writer reminds us that this is a community, and more important, a community whose God draws people from the ends of the earth. This diverse group receives the word of the Holy Spirit, and they obey that word. The Holy Spirit moved within this group, which was as different from each other as you can imagine. And the question we might ask ourselves after reading this list of names is what it means for us as a congregation gathered in the name of Jesus Christ to be side by side in biblical study or in community work with people who are our opposites in every way, in origin, in race, in worldview, and yet despite having that diverse community also be open to the way that the Holy Spirit would speak to us as a group? How open are we to fellowshipping with people who look or sound or think or act differently than us? It would seem from Scripture that the church that Jesus desires is one in which people from everywhere, people as different as you can imagine from one another, they all worship and serve Jesus together. Are we open as a church to people who are different? Or how could we be more open to people who are different? So that's our first point. We have this remarkable and strange and wonderful fellowship of believers at Antioch who are obedient to the Holy Spirit when they hear her speak. And they send out Paul and Barnabas, laying hands on them with their blessing. Now the book of Acts is very clear that all of the power all of the work is accomplished through the gifting of the Holy Spirit. When people go and preach and teach and heal and love their neighbor, they go only under the power of God's Spirit, which was poured out at Pentecost. And we're going to say a little bit more about that in just a moment. But the book of Acts is equally clear that as a people, as a community of faith, we are always called to participate in God's work. The community at Antioch hears from the Spirit, and they send Paul and Barnabas off to minister with their blessing. One writer says it's not by their own initiative that they send out Paul and Barnabas, it's by God's initiative. And here the recognition of Christian unity, of fellowship and purpose in the Holy Spirit was expressed when the congregation placed their hands on the apostles. So this isn't just the mission of Paul and of Barnabas, but it's the mission of the entire community that sends them out. The community of faith participates in God's work in this world. And this is also true of us today. We are all called to cooperate with God's work in the world, in both through what we do, in the ways in which we love God and love our neighbor, but also when we support others and enable others to go out and to do the work that God has called them to do. So we also cooperate with God when we enable others to go, whether that's through financial support or through prayer support or through training them in some way or for giving people a place to share what they're doing. Whatever it is that we do to empower others to go shows that we're also a part of God's mission. We're all a part of God's work in this world. <clears throat> 
So that's the community in Antioch that sends out Saul and, or Paul and Barnabas on their work. And then they begin to bring the message of Jesus, according to the book of Acts, to the ends of the entire earth. Someone has pointed out that it's actually because of the work of Acts that we have all those lovely diagrams in the back of our Bibles about Paul's journeys to the world. If you were to look, you could see them trace where Paul went. Because he does journey quite a lot, but if we only had the letters of Paul, we cannot see all his journeys through those. It's only because uh, Luke recorded them in the book of Acts that we have these lovely maps about all the places that Paul went. And if you're familiar with Paul's journeys, you know uh, that he certainly had his fair share of adventure. And the story in Acts chapter 14 is one of those great adventures. It's been described as a cross-cultural experience. The people in Lystra seem to be kind of a rural people in that they speak their own tongue. Uh, They understand the Roman language, but they uh, tend to speak to each other in their own language. And in addition, Lystra was the home of a big temple to the Greek god Zeus, which factors into the story that we read. The town is thoroughly pagan in its worship. It's a bit of a backwater place. Um, And both the location and uh, the fact that it's quite pagan play into the story. A story that we kind of mentioned at the outset is laced with a little bit of humor. It begins with Paul preaching and he begins and he encounters a man who's been unable to walk from birth. Most likely this man has been sitting at the gates of the city because it's interesting they everywhere Paul goes he tends to go into the synagogues but not here in Lystra so that seems to indicate that there was no synagogue which was the Jewish place of worship in Lystra. So he had to preach at the town square or at the temple gates. So this man listens to Paul while Paul is speaking. And Paul looks straight at him. Some translations say he looks him in the eye or he gazes intently at him. And Paul sees within this man a spark of something which he discerns as the faith to be healed. And that word healed also means saved, and it also means to be made whole. So Paul sees something in this man that's sitting there. One writer described what Paul sees is an act of hope. That is that this man has a hope for this healing and a trust that God and God alone can provide it. And this is the nature of faith in the book of Acts. Trust in God who will keep God's promises. Against all odds, this man has that spark of hope or faith enough to be healed. I say against all odds because remember he's living in this pagan city that worshipped Greek idols, most specifically Zeus and Hermes. And he also had a disability which says stemmed from his birth. He'd never been able to walk all of his life. But this man has a hope for healing and a trust that God alone can provide that healing for him. And so Paul tells him to stand straight on his feet and immediately he leaps up and he walks around. Now, normally, that would be the most interesting part of the story, but in fact, that's just a preamble to the rest of the story. This is where things get interesting here in Lystra. Now, the crowds are amazed at this act of healing performed by these two mysterious strangers, and they begin speaking, we're told, in their own Laconian language. So the point of that little detail is that Paul and Barnabas don't know what these people are saying. So initially, they don't know what's going on with this crowd. We can imagine that Paul and Barnabas were probably quite excited because the people were so excited at their preaching and their healing and they get stirred up and they get excited and so maybe they're giving each other high fives on the side and saying, look, look at how these people are responding to our preaching. But all of a sudden the crowd begins to boil up and get stirred up because they have decided that these two are the Greek gods Zeus and Hermes and if these are Greek gods... Remember, they have this story playing in their head of gods who went unrecognized and then poured out their wrath on the people. And so they decide that they're not going to forget this time. They are not going to refuse to show hospitality to these two Greek gods. They're going to offer them sacrifices. And they go and they get the priest from the temple of Zeus and they get him in on the action. And they start bringing bulls and garlands to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. And here's 
where Paul and Barnabas suddenly clue in and realize what's going on with the people. They step in to stop what is going on. The people have mistaken this, mysteri- mis- uh, this miraculous healing that Paul performs to mean that Paul and Barnabas must be gods come down to us in human form. Now this is a really interesting uh, little point. It's a historical point, but I think it's important. The major player in the book of Acts is Paul, and yet Barnabas is called Zeus here. And if you have an even passing familiarity with Greek mythology, you realize that Zeus is kind of the head of all the gods in the Greek mythology. And uh, Hermes is a little bit of an afterthought. So why would they associate Barnabas with Zeus and Paul with Hermes? Well, some of the history people have said that Paul is the central figure in Acts, so it may seem strange that the people of Lystra identified Barnabas as Zeus, who was the most important of the two gods. However, historical evidence reveals that it was a common belief in the ancient world that when two gods came down to earth, the lesser god did all the talking. Now, Paul does a lot of talking, so it seems that since Paul did the preaching, the people probably concluded that Barnabas must be the greater god, Now that's a small historical point, but one thing it does is kind of underscores the uh, the authenticity of this narrative. It shows that this is probably really what happened because uh, if it didn't, then they would have probably said that Paul was Zeus. So that's a little interesting historical point. So the people in Lystra have their own version of gods and they think they know how gods work. And so they confuse the work that these apostles do in their midst with the work of the gods. And they tell themselves the story that they've always uh, been told before. One writer says that Paul and Barnabas perform a Christian miracle that gets misinterpreted totally out of their context and into the context of Greek legend of the time. So they interpret this new experience according to their previous mindset according to what they already think they know about theology, according to what they already know about miracles and about God. And it is the same with us today. Whenever anything new comes into our lives, whether it's something that's welcome or something that's unwelcome, it's inevitable that we will interpret it according to our past. This leads to confusion, which is sometimes funny, but also sometimes very painful. God was moving in a new way in Lystra when Paul and Barnabas come to minister among them, but the people cannot see the way that God was moving because they were stuck in their old patterns and their old experiences and their old idolatry. So the story up until this point is fairly amusing. Paul and Barnabas don't know what's going on. The people are rushing around trying to get these sacrifices together, but then it takes a more serious turn. Because Paul and Barnabas finally clue in here to what is going on with the people, and we read that they tear their clothes. They're so distraught that people would mistake them for gods that they react in a way that indicates great grief or great sorrow. Were they overreacting? I think that maybe they weren't. One writer says their reaction which we might perceive as extreme, is significant because it conveys to those who are watching that the mistake is a grievous error. It's almost as if they receive news of a death. Not only are these disciples stricken because they have been called gods, but they're distraught that the Laconians would have consistently missed the clues that God has placed in front of them, and they perceive them to be natural reason or discernment. So we've already said the community of Lystra was a thoroughly pagan town committed to worshiping Zeus and Hermes, and this blinds them to the work of God in their midst. For as Paul and Barnabas tell them, God has never left himself without a witness. They cry out to the people, what do you think you're doing? We're not gods, we're men just like you. And we're here to bring you the message, to persuade you to abandon these silly God superstitions and embrace God himself, the living God. We don't make God. He makes us. 
And he makes all of this, sky, earth, sea, and everything in them. In the generations before us, God let all the different nations go their own way. But even then, he didn't leave them without a clue, for he made a good creation. He poured down rain and gave bumper crops. When your bellies were full and your hearts are happy, there was evidence of good beyond your own doing. Paul and Barnabas tell the people that God has always left a clue of himself, a witness of himself to all the peoples of this world. Romans 1, 19 through 20 says, The basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes can't such, or as such can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of God's divine being. So nobody has a good excuse. Sometimes we just have to open our eyes to see the fingerprints of God in this world. Because according to scripture, they're all over the place. The apostles Paul and Barnabas, however, when they spread the message of God's creation in this cross-cultural place, they have to clear up this misunderstanding. The people declare the gods have come down to us in human form. And you know, the truth is that they're not far off. Only, it wasn't Paul and Barnabas that were gods come down to them in human form. I think that was a fairly significant statement that they make. Gods have to come down to us in human form because that is true. That did happen. God did come down to us in human form. He came down to walk among us. But that human form that God took was Jesus Christ. And it is to Jesus Christ and to the Father that sent him. That's who Paul and Barnabas want to point those people to. It's the job of a witness to Jesus to always point away from themselves and point instead to God. One writer says that Jesus' disciples are not motivated by personal power, wealth, or status. Indeed, they often put themselves at great risk and endure persecution for the sake of the gospel. They know that they cannot control or manipulate the gift of the Holy Spirit, but they trust this Spirit to work through them as God sees fit. So the ministries of an apostle do not draw attention to themselves, but they point to the good news of God's kingdom, drawing near to Jesus Christ. Comparisons are often drawn between the pluralistic world of the first century and that of our own day. How will the gospel be heard amidst so many competing voices and worldviews? Today, as always, the Spirit calls leaders to be servants and not masters, to abandon self-centered agendas and delusions of grandeur, and to engage humbly and creatively in this great adventure of translating and proclaiming the gospel in a world of such stunning diversity. Christians spread the good news by pointing away from themselves and instead pointing to the work of God in the world. Now remember, the Holy Spirit is always responsible for the power to minister in Acts. Whatever great and wonderful things that the people do, we're always reminded that the power for these actions, whether it's preaching or healing or spreading the word of God to the ends of the earth, they're always performed under the power of the Holy Spirit. The official name of the book of Acts is actually the Acts of the Apostles, but some people have suggested we need to change that to the Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's the job of the servant of God to point away from themselves and point instead to God, who supplies all the power. One writer says it this way, God and God alone is the source of healing and life and salvation in Acts. And we as God's servants carry God's power to heal and to renew life in our hands and in our mouths when we are called by God to love our neighbors and proclaim in good, the good news in word and in deed. You see, no matter how pluralistic 
our world becomes, no matter where we go, the truth is that the fingerprints of God are everywhere if we care to look for them. Because God goes ahead of us into every nation and to the very ends of the earth. God was ahead of Paul and Barnabas here in Lystra. He was already there in that place with a large temple to a pagan god and a people who are mostly content to worship uh, their own local deities instead of the living God. And against all odds, he puts that spark of faith into that one man who'd been unable to walk since he was born. And it's Paul and Barnabas' job to point away from themselves and to name for this people God, who's been at work in this world, and God, who has been at work among them. They had no name for this work before, but Paul and Barnabas say it's the rain and the crops and full bellies and joy in our hearts. All of those are evidence of the fingerprints of God in our lives. And our job as disciples and as witnesses to this world is to always be, have our eyes wide open so that we look for and notice the ways that God's at work in the world. And also to remember that God doesn't always work in ways that we expect. And then we point out that work to others as we go about our lives. As we read about Paul and Barnabas, these encounters ought to inspire us to see the unexpected ways that God calls us to serve God and neighbor in our everyday lives. So as we go forward this week, let us go in the faith that God is at work in this world. And let us also go with a commitment to look for the ways that he's at work in our lives as well. And think of ways that we might be able to tell another about how God works among us. Let's pray. God of all, you opened up your gates wide to receive your children into the heavenly kingdom. Help us to be vehicles of promise and proclamation for all who will listen, so that every soul might live in your grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.